Hello everyone, this is Brad Wistens. The oddity that's going to be featured in this video is a large-scale cargo space plane. My requirements here were to make a stock space plane that's fully reusable and could land back at the Kerbal Space Center. There's a lot of criteria we could use here to assess performance. I like min-maxing, so what I focused on was maximizing the ratio of payload mass to takeoff mass. I'm going to show my attempt at maximum payload to orbit later. First I want to show how this plane works with a more usual payload. Without any payload, the plane itself weighs 592 tons with fuel and 229 tons without fuel. I'll include all the exact numbers from this video in the video description if you want to check those out. For the first launch here, I'm going to bring a test payload to orbit. The test payload is going to weigh 715 tons. This isn't that close to the maximum of what this is going to be able to do, but this will give us an example of how this plane is going to work. Also, one of the criteria for this mission was that it could bring bulky payloads. The maximum mass to orbit launch that we're going to do later is going to have an extremely dense payload, so this will be good to show that it met that requirement. There's a lot of design challenges when building large space planes like this. I wanted to focus on two of them at the beginning here. One of them is the perennial issue with space planes, and that's we want the center of mass to be roughly at the same place relative to the center of lift during both the ascent and the descent. Naturally, with space planes, the center of mass usually tends to move backwards because most of our dry mass, mostly the engines, is concentrated at the back, and that means that we're either extremely inefficient at flying on the way up or completely unstable on the way down. This is solved here by mounting roughly half of the engines near the front of the craft. This results in its own design issues, but nothing that can't be resolved. The other challenge I want to talk about is the lack of large stock cargo bays. They simply aren't big enough for an application like this, and doing something fancy with a stock hinge or some of the new moving parts doesn't really hide your payload from the aero model, which is our goal. You could use a fairing, but after breaking the fairing, suddenly you have a big flat part on the beginning of your plane and it's not going to fly very well during landing. I got around this by building my plane in two parts. The front part docks onto the front of the payload and the rear part docks onto the rear of the payload. After reaching orbit, both parts can undock and then redock with each other and now you have a plane that is ready to land. Technically, this means that the payload fairing itself is not reused. However, I think it's not unreasonable to count the payload fairing as part of the payload, and I would say that this space plane remains 100% reusable. For the maximum fractional payload attempt, I've packed together a bunch of radial ore tanks due to their high density. This gives me a payload with a 1,010 ton mass conveniently packaged into as small of a radius as possible. For the actual ascent, I've replaced the radial ore tanks with an equal mass of clipped fuel tanks in order to reduce my part count. The 1,010 ton payload on top of our 592 ton space plane brings our total takeoff mass to 1,601 tons. Incidentally, this gives us a 63% fractional payload. With the additional takeoff mass, our TWR is going to be too low to accelerate to a adequate speed to fly by the end of the runway. So I've placed this craft such that it will roll down the incline behind the runway and across the level field to the west of the Kerbal Space Center. I've used this technique before in a couple videos because reducing dry mass is absolutely critical. The best way to do this is reducing the number of engines used and reducing the number of wings used both of which is going to require a longer takeoff run. By the time that we have to take off, I've reached 180 meters per second. This high takeoff speed really helped because it meant I could optimize this for high speed flight, which really helps us get through the 300 meters per second to 400 meters per second segment, which is the hardest speed to accelerate through with the rapier engines. From here, the low drag aerodynamics of this plane means that we want to go with as shallow of an ascent profile as possible. The limiting factor here is not drag, but overheating. I designed this ascent profile to be right at the limit of what this craft can actually take without overheating. Another thing I've optimized here is minimizing the number of air intakes used. 
At about 600 meters per second, the rapiers started using so much fuel that the air intakes couldn't fully supply them anymore, and the engine started flaming out, and I even throttled back for a little bit. However, really the critical part of this ascent is between 300 meters per second and 400 meters per second, and above 1400 meters per second. And I didn't have any trouble with a lack of air during these intervals. The air breathing phase gets me to 1660 meters per second at an altitude of 17 kilometers, at which point I fire up the LVNs. Just a moment later, I close the air intakes and switch the rapiers over to closed cycle mode. Efficient ascent with this rapier LVN combination is all about minimizing the amount of use of the rapiers on closed cycle mode. It's great that they can do this, but they're extremely inefficient at it. So the idea is to just get our orbit close enough to suborbital trajectory that the LVNs are going to be able to do the rest of the work. At 29 kilometers and 2,030 meters per second, I am out of oxidizer, and it's going to be all up to the LVNs to push me from here into a suborbital trajectory and then to circularize my orbit. Again, due to the low drag, shallow was the name of the game for this ascent profile, and I've optimized this to give me just enough time to get my apoapsis above 70 kilometers before I start falling back down to the surface. I got this ascent so flat that there was an 11 minute coast between reaching suborbital trajectory and turning my LVNs off and actually reaching space. After about a 20 second circularization burn, I reach a full Kerbin orbit with nine meters per second of delta V remaining. We took off with a mass of 1,601 tons. We've used 362 tons of fuel to get to orbit. And we've got about one ton of fuel left, which is good because we do need some fuel to inject us into a suborbital trajectory. While we only have nine meters per second of fuel right now, our current mass is about 1,239 tons, 1,010 of which is our payload, so after getting rid of the payload, we'll have plenty to land with. This is especially good because after undocking the front of the plane from the payload and the rear of the plane from the payload, we still need to dock the rear to the front of the plane. For my injection burn, I'm going to put my periapsis down to 40 kilometers. Due to the low drag of this, we're going to be doing a lot of coasting. I'm also going to use the wings to maintain some altitude to prevent overheating. And for both of these reasons, it's going to take us a long time to slow down. And I'm actually going to do more than a full lap of carbon during the descent. The design of this gave me a lot of freedom to do some weight balancing. And as a result, this flies quite well at high speed and high altitude. It's not until the final landing approach where this is going to become really difficult. We're going to do our approach to the Kerbal Space Center real low because we've got a lot more slowing down to do. While missing a mountaintop collision is always a challenge, the real challenge here is avoiding missing the runway along the north-south direction. At low speeds, this plane likes to drift very alarmingly in the yaw axis, especially when you're using the ailerons, and we need to use the ailerons to help us roll and aim for the runway. So this is just a question of doing all the maneuvers as soon as possible, as smoothly as possible, and as slow as possible, to make sure that we're lined up with the runway well before we get there. For the takeoff run, I designed the landing gear such that the craft had a natural pitch up, which really helped us get off the ground. Now that we've shortened the craft, the difference in height between the front and the rear landing gear is magnified, which means that we're going to have a lot of pitch up when we touch down. In fact, there's pretty much no way that I can avoid having my front landing gear hit before the rear landing gear, which will increase my pitch and as a result, this craft is just going to bounce when you hit the runway. And the only thing I can do is to limit this bounce as much as possible and try to keep it controllable. After the first touch, it's going to look like the craft is drifting down the runway. It is, in fact, floating just above the runway, which really isn't any better due to the alarming yaw to the left. However, I am able to get it back down on the runway in time, and the high friction of the rear landing gear allows me to yaw the front of the plane back around and get us coasting straight down the runway. And after that little bit of touchdown drama, our plane has landed safely at the KSC.
So to recap, we've gotten a 1,010 ton mass payload and gotten it to low curve in orbit. And we've done it with a fully reusable space plane where that mass was 63% of our takeoff mass. This was the main criteria for performance in this mission. I did everything I could think of to optimize it. I'm happy with how it turned out, but let's take a moment to think about how we could push this even further. Adding a couple ion engines to the mix would definitely help us circularize more efficiently. That would give us a very tiny boost to the overall number here. We could also try adjusting the TWR, use the wings used, different parts of the ascent profile. There's so many variables here that we'll never run out of ways to improve something like this. With all that said, I can't think of anything that would dramatically improve this and get significantly past that 63% number. So my challenge to anyone who's watching this is, think of something I'm missing. What's something I could do that would seriously improve this? Anyway guys, thank you very much for watching, and have a good day.